Nobody can really tell what's going to happen in the future, but in this video I just want to talk about what I think is the future of bodybuilding, especially the professional division of pro, uh, pro bodybuilding. Uh, I, I think I could, I'm qualified to talk on this since I've been involved in bodybuilding in, both as a competitor and in publishing as a writer and also in research for nearly 60 years. So I, I've been to a lot of contests, I've known a lot of bodybuilding champions, I've competed myself, I know all the nuances of, of bodybuilding, what it takes to be a champion, bodybuilder, and this and that. So based on that, I kind of want to give my observations or my opinions on what's going to be the future of bodybuilding. Uh, and now anyone who's been around bodybuilding the last couple of years has obviously known, uh, have seen a couple of uh, quite obvious changes. Uh, I think a lot of these changes occurred uh, with the beginning with the reign of uh, of uh, Dorian Yates, starting in 1991. Uh, he he kind of uh, opened up a new level of muscle mass that became standard in bodybuilding, where in other words, if you didn't have a certain amount of muscle mass, you didn't really have a chance of uh, competing on the elite professional level. Now, you know, you have to understand what does it take to get that level of muscle mass? Well, for one thing, it takes a certain level type of genetics. Not everyone could be uh, a Mr. Olympia competitor. I've talked about this in past videos. I won't repeat myself uh, as to what the genetic factors uh, that go into uh, the making a professional bodybuilder are. But let's just say that it's a kind of a small percentage of people have the favorable genetics to make it to the pro level. A lot of people wouldn't want to be pro bodybuilders, but that's another story. So, uh, but the second thing is, it's the, uh, if you want to call it the 800 pound elephant in the room or, or the 375 pound bodybuilder in the room, this is of course drugs, uh, you know, and this is what makes the difference. This is the difference between bodybuilders, uh, current bodybuilders, let's say of the last 25, 30 years, and bodybuilders of, let's say the 70s, uh, even the 80s and earlier years, uh, you go back to the 50s and 40s, the big difference is uh, not only uh, different types of training techniques, uh, newer, let's say, exercise machines, but the real major difference is in the amount of anabolic drugs used. It's no secret. I mean, uh, for example, you, you look at uh, a hormone like insulin. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, but no bodybuilders would ever think about using insulin. Insulin reserved for, was reserved strictly for the treatment of type 1 diabetics who completely do not uh, manufacture insulin due to, due to a destruction of the beta cells of the pancreas or some types of type 2 diabetics who require uh, insulin because the other oral anti-diabetic drugs just don't work for them. Uh, somebody got the idea, probably I would say... I think it would start around, I would say, probably the early 90s of, of bodybuilders, healthy bodybuilders, injecting insulin. Uh, and the insulin uh, is used for a number of reasons. For one, uh, growth hormone is also commonly used by a lot of elite pro bodybuilders. And uh, unfortunately, one of the side effects of growth hormone is hyperglycemia, excessive blood glucose levels, which could... Uh, it's thought to be a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. So you counter that by injecting insulin, which lowers the blood glucose. Secondary reason for insulin is that it promotes increased glycogen storage in muscle. Glycogen is carbohydrate stored in muscle. And when, when it's stored, uh, let's see, uh, a little bit more than usual, you get a fuller, bigger looking muscle. And also, uh, in the presence of large amounts of amino acids in the blood, Insulin d does provide anabolic effects only when there are large amounts of amino acids in the blood. Otherwise, insulin is what they call anti-catabolic. It helps to prevent muscle breakdown, which is useful if you're training for a contest and you're on a stringent diet. The big, the big problem with dieting of any kind is that there's usually always some, some level of muscle loss. And anything you could do that will slow down or blunt that muscle loss is useful and uh, that's where insulin comes in. So the combination of insulin, growth hormone, and uh, various anabolic steroids, that largely accounts for the look of uh, today's current bodybuilders. You know, where they could walk on a uh, compete weighing, you know, just under 300 pounds and some of these guys get 
to be over th something like 340 pounds in the off season. They're like 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 you know, but it raises the question of, you know, how far could this go? I mean, how big could bodybuilders get? I mean, is there a certain point where they're, no matter how many drugs they use, they're not going to get any bigger? My suspicion is that that is exactly what would happen. Uh, I did an article in my Applied Metabolic Newsletter, uh, basically talking about the limitations to muscle size. In other words, I explained in this article, I, uh, it was a lot of technical material that I translated into basic English that anyone could understand. I discussed why muscles have limits to growth. Why, for example, anyone can't get a 32-inch arm, for example. <laughs> there, there are certain limits within the muscle, no matter what your genetics are, that limit that. However, it seems like the trend in professional bodybuilding especially, and, and less so in other divisions like amateurs and uh, the other divisions, there seems to be a trend where bigger is better. In other words, the biggest guy, like you have a guy who's the, like the winner of the last two Olympias, uh, Big Ramey, he's a big man. I mean, you know, he, uh, if he was, uh, you know, 50 pounds lighter, uh, would, he have, would, he, would he have won? Well, that's a kind of open question. Because if he was 50 pounds lighter, competing, uh, that is competing 50 pounds lighter, 50 pounds lighter, he would be considerably smaller than he appears, but he would also be much more muscular. I mean, much more muscular. He'd be shredded to the bone. Now, is his muscle shape good enough to win? That's really hard to say because I don't think a guy like Big Ramy would be willing to drop 50 pounds to test that out in competition. He wants to get bigger and bigger because he thinks, as do most of the pro bodybuilders, that size wins. And, you know, when is this going to end? I mean, you've had a couple of guys, uh, uh, as you know, and I've talked about this, others have talked about this in other videos. I mean, there's been a rash of deaths of bodybuilders. Uh, some of them are older, but a lot of them are younger. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the names. I've done that before. But some of these guys are, you know, early 30s. 20s. I mean, this is unheard of to die of stuff like cardiovascular complications. And although there could be genetic factors involved that would cause a man, let's say 26 years old, like Dallas McCarver, to, to die of uh, a cardiovascular disease, uh, you know, it's got to be more than just drugs, usually, because there's a lot of his contemporaries, his peers, meaning other competitors are using the same drugs. Uh, maybe not as much, but using the same drugs, they're not dropping dead. Uh, he had to have some sort of genetic time bomb. And it turns out in his case, he had a family history of cardiovascular disease. So he was set up to unfortunately be a, uh, uh, a victim of uh, heavy drug use. But, you know, you know again, what, where will this end? I mean, are they going to, uh, gonna, I mean, you can only, if they keep on increasing the amount of drugs they use, I mean, they're already taking far more than the body makes. Let's say, to, let's take a look at testosterone example. The average man produces 11 milligrams, 9 to 11 milligrams of testosterone a day. That's it, 9 to 11. Now, what does the average pro bodybuilder take and uh, when they take testosterone? Anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams a week. The body was not set up to use that much testosterone. So when you take that much testosterone, you're in no man's land. Uh, you don't know what can happen. You don't know what the long range effects are. Now, you might say, well, what, what's gonna happen to these guys? This relates to the future of bodybuilding. What's gonna happen to these current competitors today who are using huge amounts of drugs? So what's gonna happen when they hit, let's say 50 years old or something, 60 years old? Uh, you know, they're going to probably be retired. You know, they, they'll get off the drugs. I'm sure that there's no reason to use huge amounts of steroids if you're not competing. That would be pretty stupid. But, I, you know, I, I'm giving them, you know, credit that they wouldn't do that. But the question is, uh, this heavy drug, drug use that they use for, let's say, several years. And I'm assuming that, you know, they get off the drugs. Um, you know, you use a, a heavy drug regime in preparation for a contest and, Usually, you, uh, most sensible guys get off the drugs and allow their bodies to kind of clean out, you know, their liver, their blood lipids, everything returns to normal, and this allows them to basically stay alive. However, from what I understand, there's been a, 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 a type of system uh, where now people stay on drugs all the time. 
They don't use the same amount of drugs they do before a show, but they stay on lower levels because they want to keep their muscle size. And from a medical viewpoint, this is absolute disaster. And this, again, relates to the future of bodybuilding because all these guys and women or whoever who are staying on drugs, even low-level low level steroids drugs all the time, all year year, are absolutely wrecking, them, wrecking their health and they are not going to live a long time. I guarantee you. How do I know? Because there's been preliminary studies. They didn't know this years ago. Apparently, consistent high-dose steroid regimes cause structural changes in the heart that are permanent. Unlike a lot of the other side effects that are, uh, that, uh, that are common with heavy steroid use, such as adverse changes to blood lipids uh, and a couple of other things, that usually reverse when you get off uh, of uh, liver changes, for example, elevations in liver enzymes. These things tend to revert to normal when you get off the drugs. However, structural changes in the heart are permanent. So what, that, what does that mean? That means that these guys are setting themselves up for probably early cases of congestive heart failure. Uh, they probably, uh, again, I, I don't want this to be true, but I think you're going to be hearing about uh, a lot of guys uh, are going to be dropping dead in their fit early. And some of these guys who are competing today will be dying in their early 50s from a congestive heart failure because of their use of both anabolic steroids and growth hormone, both of which are, are uh, cause and when used in large doses, cause structural changes in the heart that are, are considered negative. Uh, you also get an increase of calcium deposition in the coronary arteries which uh, could set you up for a future heart attack, a stroke. Uh, so, you know, the future does not look rosy as far from a health perspective to uh, for these current competitors. Uh, the people that they take drug advice from, these so-called uh, coaches or gurus, whatever you want to call them, uh, they do not have any background in drug pharmacology. Uh, and even if they did, no one could predict the long-term effects of these strokes on health. In other words, they don't. none of these guys can tell an athlete what's gonna happen uh, after years of high dose steroid regime use. Now, this raises the question of if the current drugs, uh, various, uh, oh, let me also mention, there's one particular drug that I think is gonna be especially disastrous. And unfortunately, it happens to be one of the most popular anabolic steroids by both competitors and non-competitors. But this is actually a, a, a huge time bomb and this is Trenbolone. Trenbolone is not a legal steroid. It, 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 uh, the drug companies stopped producing it a long time ago. It's only produced by black market shady companies where you don't even know if you're getting the real drug. But Trenbolone itself is unique among anabolic steroids because it causes uh, changes in the brain. Uh, it increases the production of toxic unfolded proteins uh, that are related to the onset of Alzheimer's disease and various brain degeneration. So what does that mean in practical terms? High, people who use Trenbolone all the time can expect to have serious brain disease comparable to what they call early, on, early onset Alzheimer's, where Alzheimer's is usually a disease of the elderly, like people over 60. But there is a form of Alzheimer's where people as young as in their 40s uh, due to genetic, uh, due to an uh, abnormal protein called presenilin, they tend to get early onset Alzheimer's. Well, when you take Trenbolone, you're turning yourself into a kind of early Alzheimer's patient. Uh, so I predict that a lot of these people, uh, whether they're competitive bodybuilders or not, if they use Trenbolone all the time, it's not even a pure drug. It's an underground steroid. There's no quality control. You don't know what they're putting in that drug. They're going to be screwed up. I, I, believe me, I hope I'm wrong. I don't wish this on anyone, but I'm going by the emerging science. I've seen a lot of studies about uh, this related to Trenbolone. It's an extremely dangerous steroid to use. The most dangerous, in my opinion, of all the anabolics. Uh, I'd even rate it the formerly most dangerous was Anadrol 50, an oral steroid that is very good for building strength and size. However, it it's absolutely d d beats the crap out of your liver. If you use it more than five weeks, you can expect serious liver problems. That used to be the most toxic steroid, uh, but now it's superseded by Trenbolone. So now this raises the question again of, you know, since steroids can only take you so far uh, and growth harm and all that, 
What's going to be in the future for bodybuilders who want to get bigger and bigger and bigger? Well, you know, some people talk about gene therapy. Now, you know, gene therapy is still, I have to emphasize, it's still experimental. Gene therapy involves the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the injecting a gene using a, a inert viral carrier like an adenovirus attaches to a gene. Let's say a gene for, for example, insulin-like growth factor of one. It attaches to this dead virus. They inject it into the muscle and it starts to greatly produce the internal form of IGF-1. IGF-1 is produced in muscle and also in the liver. The one in the liver is called systemic IGF-1. It's important for your brain, your heart, and your connective tissue, but it doesn't have much to do with muscle growth. The one that's produced in muscle, IGF-1, there's three forms of it, three variants. One of them is called mechanic growth factor, and there's IGF-1 and there's another one. These three are very, very potent anabolic substances in muscle. When you inject the gene for IGF-1 in muscle, it, it completely it causes crazy muscle growth. So far, in animal experiments, they gave it to rats, and it, I think, it, if I remember correctly, it, it kind of like doubled their muscle growth in something like four or five weeks. So of course, that's a very attractive to bodybuilders and athletes. Uh, however, it's also important to know that you know, when you're messing with uh, with genes, you're messing with things like uh, DNA possible mutations. It could cause cancer. Uh, in fact, they've used gene therapy, not not IGF-1, but other forms of gene therapy. They've tried to use it to treat certain diseases. Unfortunately, uh, in some cases, it went awry or it went wrong, where the people who were given gene therapy died because they because of changes. It it, oh, it has to do with overstimulates the immune system and cause cancer and tumors uh, and all this kind of thing. So gene therapy is uh, uh, definitely a medicine of the future. Uh, that you could also design gene therapy uh, where you're, uh, where it would uh, it would block, for example, myostatin. Uh, myostatin is a protein produced in muscle that prevents muscle growth. You would you can inject a gene in the muscle that will block myostatin. Uh, and you get like again double triple the muscle growth uh, and these are again are probably attractive alternatives for bodybuilders in the future uh, also gene therapy uh, I don't think as far as I know there's a way to test for it but, but despite this the World Anti-Doping Organization banned gene, uh, gene doping they call it uh, back in 2004 in other words they foresaw the use of this in athletes, and uh, and they decided to, you know, uh, do a uh, uh, what is it called a uh, 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 a strike, uh, you know, a, a uh, they they tried to they, they they foresaw the possible use of gene th uh, doping, so they banned it in 2004, even before it was being used, but you know this is a, a possibility for I, I think bodybuilders in the future, if as soon as they perfect gene doping, if you want to call it. It's going to supersede anabolic steroids because, for one thing, uh, once it's perfected, it probably will not come with the same type of side effects associated with uh, anabolic steroids and growth hormone and insulin, such as adverse changes to lipids, you know, uh, cardiac adverse cardiac changes, liver problems. The gene therapy doping will more or less stay right in the muscle, so it'll probably be a very popular therapy for uh, bodybuilders and athletes, but as to what can happen, even when it is perfected, that again is unpredictable. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, there's still a limit to how much muscle size you can gain. Uh, now, as far as the popularity of bodybuilding goes, I mean, uh, right now I would, I would characterize professional bodybuilding as a kind of a niche sport or cult in the sense that uh, it attracts a, 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 a kind of far, far smaller number of people. Uh, the majority of people don't like the appearance of current professional bodybuilders. They consider them too big, too bloated. I mean, for a while there, you had that big bloated stomach sticking out, which was absolutely macabre. It was disgusting looking. Uh, you don't see that as much anymore. You still see it. It still exists. There's a couple of bodybuilders that cost uh, Phil Heath probably his title, the last time he competed, uh, 
because he still had a little bit of abdominal bloat. It still exists, but it's not as prevalent as it used to be. But, uh, you know, with the gene therapy, you're not going to have that kind of stuff. But the point is, most people don't like the look of today's bodybuilder. And for this reason, you have these other divisions were created, like classic bodybuilder. And uh, I think it's called men's bodybuilding, where they wear the board shorts, uh, where they don't show their thighs. But, you know, these guys are very lean and cut in their upper body. And, of course, the classic bodybuilders... They don't wear the uh, kind of, uh, what are they, jock strap uh, posing trunks that the pro bodybuilders wear. They wear, uh, they wear you know, the kind of uh, uh, trunks that were more like the, what they wore back in the 70s. And in fact, the physiques are supposedly mimicking the 70s, you know, the classic. However, even as, uh, the, even from what I see, just the past couple of years, the, even the classic guys are trying to get bigger and bigger. Unfor luckily for them, there are apparently some rules or limits to how much they could weigh, so they, they can't get too big. So Arnold Schwarzenegger was supposedly has said that he believes classic bodybuilding uh, will take over. In other words, eventually the gargantuan pro bodybuilders we see, we see today will just die out, kind of like the dinosaurs did <laughs> 60 million years ago, which I think is an apt comparison. you know. But the point is, though, that uh, I don't know that's true, though. I don't know that's true. I think there's always going to be an audience for the massive bodybuilders just for the fact that they some people like to look at freaks. They like to look at these gigantic guys uh, that, you know, they, they look at them like, you know, like you would look at a, like a huge massive animal. In other words, they know that it's not attainable by most people and it's fascinating for them to see this level of muscle, especially a person who can't build that kind of muscle themselves, no matter what they do. So there's always going to be a, a niche for uh, pro bodybuilding, uh, but I think that uh, I, I think it's going to probably get less and less popular as the years go by. And I do agree with Arnold, where the classic bodybuilding will be will kind of step up, to become the most popular type of bodybuilding. Uh, I'm not so sure about uh, the uh, the men's bodybuilding. Uh, you know, uh, in all due respect, let me preface these remarks. In all due respect to the competitors in men's bodybuilding. Call me old school, old fashioned or whatever, but I don't like the idea of stepping on stage wearing board shorts where you completely obscure your thigh development. That to me is not real bodybuilding. So, uh, but again, it allows men who don't have the genetics to become big to compete. In other words, uh, men's bodybuilding, they're very muscular, they have great abs, they, you know, nice physiques, upper body, but, you know, some of them are bigger than others, but none of them get to the level of a pro bodybuilder, for example. Uh, so, I, again, to sum up, as far as the women goes, uh, the guy who took over the uh, Weeder Empire is a big fan of uh, female bodybuilding. He brought back uh, the women's Olympia contests, which is nice. I mean, it's nice for the hardcore women to have a venue to compete uh, you know, however, the reason why women's bodybuilding died out was because the women got bigger, bigger, and freakier, and freakier, and it just didn't attract anybody. I mean, most women didn't like the look. Men were repelled by it, uh, you know, and, you know, it just died out. Unfortunately, that if that's the case, uh, bringing back women's bodybuilding, if they start to get that same look again, you know, that huge freaky look, well, it depends on how much money the uh, the guy who runs bodybuilding wants to put into it. From what I understand, he's a huge a huge fan of FEMA. If he continues to fund it, it can go on indefinitely as long as he's willing to put the money in. But if he's not, it's going to die out again because uh, it's just it's even more than the male bodybuilding. Most people consider uh, extreme muscularity in, in a woman unnatural. Uh, they just uh, you know again, I'm not expressing the opinion. I give credit. The female, as a former bodybuilding competitor myself, I'm absolutely amazed by the level of muscularity female bodybuilders are able to attain. I was never that ripped myself as a male. I mean, some of these women are absolutely amazing. Unfortunately, it's kind of instilled in people that a woman shouldn't be that muscular, and and, it, and it, you know, it's just widespread. I mean, the only other people that are going to be oppressed by it, Bailey, are other female bodybuilders or what my friend Don Ross used to call schmoes. These are these kind of like little Weasley guys that have a thing for 
hardcore female body Belisa, you know, they hire them to wrestle with them and beat them up and that kind of stuff. They'll always, <laughs> they'll always love female body Belisa. That's their fantasy women, you know. But anyway, hey, I wish them all the best. Don't get me wrong. As far as the other divisions, there's nothing to say about them. You know, the fitness girls, they'll stay the same. They, you know, they, they're not gonna. They might get a little bit more muscular. Uh, you know, if they listen to some of the diet coaches, some of them will wind up getting sick also, not necessarily from steroids, but from stuff like too much clenbuterol, too much thyroid. There'll probably be a couple of medical cases there too from listening to bad advice, but they're not, there's not going to be much change in those divisions. As far as bikini girls, they're already getting a little bit more muscular than they were when the first division, when they first started that division. Uh, but they're not going to get much different either. You know, they, they can't get too muscular too because they lose points. And so that's about it. And uh, so uh, I don't think bodybuilding, bodybuilding will always be uh, around. But, you know, I, I think bodybuilding actually reached its peak years ago. I think many of you will agree with me. The 70s, uh, when Arnold's era, I believe that's uh, maybe all the way into the 80s and early 90s. That's when bodybuilding reached its peak of popularity. And it's been on a downslide ever since. But it will always exist. But uh, again, you know, I hate to say this, but with, with the way the drug usage is today and the, and the huge quest for bigger, 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 I see a lot of disaster ahead for many bodybuilders. I hope I'm wrong, but that's what I see. If you want more information on nutrition, exercise, science, uh, uh, anti-aging research you can use today, effective fat loss techniques, ergogenic aids, hormonal therapy, women's health and fitness, many other topics. Nobody covers as many topics as I do in Applied Metabolics. Subscribe today, www Applied Metabolics, 40 to 50 pages every month. No ads, just pure information based on my 60 years of uh, learning and experience and all current up-to-date research. Most of the stuff in Applied Metabolics, you will not find on the web, you won't find it in blogs. I, it's off the road stuff, but it's very useful. It's very practical. Everything I write in, in uh, Applied Metabolics is a practical use. I'm not going to write on something that sounds interesting, but is of no practical use. I can't see the point of doing that. So, I mean, I'm not going to write about how uh, Mr. Olympia builds big arms, because to me, that's so played out. That is so old. There's about 15,000 videos on that. I don't cover that kind of stuff. If you want to look at that, find that stuff, then look at the YouTube videos. I don't write that kind of crap. I write science and I write practical information on how to build muscle, get, uh, you know, maintain health and uh, lose body fat. That's the emphasis in applied metabolics. I think it's the best publication I've seen on the internet because for one thing, I have about 45 years of experience as a professional writer. I know how to write for the public. I, I don't use excessive jargon. I, I, any technical term I explain fully so you don't have to have a medical dictionary. So, and if when you, when you subscribe, I'll send you an invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics Facebook page where each day I post new, a new uh, uh, information on nutrition, exercise, science, uh, and general health. Uh, again, you have to be a subscriber to uh, be invited to the uh, private Facebook page. I also have an email portal on my Applied Metabolics webpage where current subscribers only can send me short questions about anything they might have read in Applied Metabolics or anything that comes to mind as long as they're short questions. I'll be happy to answer as a appreciation of your support of my work as a subscriber. Uh, for that very reason, I don't answer unsolicited questions because I only have a limited amount of time and I'm going to give that to the people that support my work. In other words, active subscribers. Uh, you, if you send me emails and you're not a subscriber, you're just wasting your time. I'm not going to answer them at all because I, again, a limited. I'm not trying to be mean. I just don't have a limited amount of time. Uh, if you, you know, so that's about it. If you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, uh, go to your shoulder. I'm looking at my dog Bruno here. Bruno recently survived a serious illness. He was in kidney failure. Uh, he had a severe kidney infection. Uh, he was in the hospital for a couple of days. And let me tell you something, this little dog is one tough guy. He's tougher than I ever was. He survived, he's blind, he's deaf, but he's still alive, he's doing fine. And he's, he's 21 years old. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that would be the equivalent of a human being about 130 years old. So this dog, uh, this dog is a super, a super dog in every sense of the word. 
Take care.